Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first video for the Elastic Synthetics team. Um, we're excited to share um, some stuff related to our 8.4.0 release with you all. And I'm here today. My name is Andrew Chalakian. I'm here today with um, the Tech Lead for Synthetics with um, one of uh, our dev team, Justin Kambik. And we're going to talk about what's new in 8.4 and some of the new ways to use synthetics that we're really excited about and we want to share with you all. So um, we're going to get into a few different things. Uh, most of these are new features in 8.4, but there's a few things that we're also going to go into a little more depth about for some interesting new workflow things we've been working on. Um, so number one, um, we're going to get into private locations. This is the new best way to run monitors on premises. And Justin's going to demo the, the way to do this. It's more powerful, um, it's easier to use, and um, we're excited to share it with you. Then we're going to talk about our um, expanded public beta with um, even easier access and broader access for our public testing infrastructure. Um, moving on past that, we're going to talk about some of the features we have that have made altering the data retention for Elastic Synthetics easier uh, with better defaults. And finally, we're going to talk about um, ways of managing secrets and parameters. It's a frequent, uh, frequently requested topic, and we're going to talk about um, the better ways to do it with our new project monitors and monitor management as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Justin, and uh, we'll get into the demo. Thanks, Andrew. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to set up some project monitors uh, using the init command that Synthetics library supplies for getting started quickly. So you basically run this command and it will take care of setting everything up for you. Uh, before we do that, we're going to show how to create a cloud deployment. We're going to have a fleet server set up and we are going to enroll a GCP instance as a private location uh, using fleet. Uh, the distinction being that you can run these locations anywhere you want, self-managed versus using the publicly managed uh, locations that we provide as part of the synthetic service. And uh, at the tail end of that, we'll show how to add some parameters to your project monitor so that you can pass custom values that you might need when you're running your scripts. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to set up some infrastructure and then we'll kind of get into more of the details about uh, how the rest of this is going to work. So, uh, Andrew, can you still see my desktop okay? I just dropped out of presenter. Yes, view. we can see your whole okay, desktop. Cool. cool. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to cloud here. Uh, this is Elastic Cloud. I'm going to create a deployment. We'll call it Synthetics Zero Release Demo. And we'll make sure that we, well, we've got version 841, but that'll work. Um, just gonna check all of the stuff looks okay. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this deployment. And uh, this will just take a moment. And uh, I guess maybe Andrew, I can jump over and, and show the Docker uh, docs in the meantime, while we wait for this to start up. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna open up a gist real quick here as well. Um, I'm going to put, these are the credentials for our deployment, which usually is a bad practice to show in public videos, but this deployment will be ephemeral. It will be deleted long before anybody sees this video. So uh, what we're looking at here is um, the Docker run command uh, instructions for basically setting up a Elastic Agent and pointing it at Fleet. Um, the one deviation from from what we're seeing here um aside from the version we're going to change that to 8.4 when we actually run this command in our gcp instance but the only other distinction here that's worth mentioning is um instead of elastic agent there's actually also a separate image that we supply called elastic agent complete and the reason for that is when synthetics is bundled into the docker image it becomes quite a bit larger and so for people that have no plans of using synthetics uh, they can save a little bit of storage space and Justin, by not having the, it included. We, we do have a, a public cloud um, testing service that we're testing. So why would someone want to run um, a Docker container to do their tests? That's a good question. Um, I didn't have an answer ready. I know the that. I know the answer. I was asking it to kind of. But, <laughs> I mean, but, but, I, I just wanted to add a little framing here for for folks who are who are who are um, who are. Um, 
um, not sure exactly why we jumped exact right into this. Um, we have many, many people who, um, um, want to test things that are behind a firewall where that right. public cloud infrastructure can't reach there. Um, and they don't want to open up the firewall, which is a legitimate concern, um, or have any other number of reasons for wanting to run their own testing node. So what we're showing, it's a little more work, but if you need to run stuff behind the firewall, this is here for you. Um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility and allows you to define your own custom testing locations um, that are meaningful to you. Well, there you go. Thank you for answering your own question. I appreciate it. Uh, I was going to go that route, but I wasn't sure if there was a more specific answer you were looking for or a less specific answer you were looking for, perhaps. Uh, okay, our deployment is ready. So I'm going to hit continue. This will pull up your Kibana. If you've never made a Elastic Cloud deployment and you just hit continue, it drops you right into Kibana and you can get started doing whatever you're going to do. Um, so what we're going to do is hop over to fleet management. And yep, okay, looking good. So at this point, we can just go ahead and work on adding an agent. So I'll click add agent, And then you can define a policy. Uh, I will just call this Synthetics demo, create the policy. We just wait a few moments for this to do its thing. And then it's going to ask us to uh, enroll in fleet. And there are a number of different ways you can go about this, but we're, like I said before, we're going to use the Docker method that is documented in this command here. So essentially what you do is um, you can just copy this from, uh, am I looking at the right one here? I think this is the one I actually want. Uh, you can just copy this command, and then you can see there's different values you need to plug in to, to make it run. So uh, we'll just hop over here. This is my GCP instance. Uh, we want this to be 841. Uh, and then the enrollment token will be displayed in your Kibana window. So if we hop back over to Kibana, uh, you need both of these. So I'm just going to grab this one first. If I can just work around Chrome's little slider control here. I guess I could copy the whole command too. But And this is an experience we're working on improving. We recognize it's a little yes. awkward grabbing this out of a dialog, but we're hoping to add in the Docker stuff. It's kind of pre-filled in this area um, at a future point, and we have an issue open for that as well. We also have an issue open, I think, to update the docs to make note of the uh, complete image, which I still have to change the image name. Um, so there's the URL, and then we just need the enrollment token, which, again, is just displayed right here. And, and as a reminder for folks who are unaware, um, what we're demoing today is all stuff that's um, in beta, mostly. Um, so there's improvements coming at a, at a rapid clip. Um, but some of those that kind of fit and finish polish will be coming in future releases um, as we kind of refine these uh, flows. OK, so I think if we run this, oh, yeah, hang on. Not used to running Docker with super user, but what's wrong with this? Couldn't parse the URL. Oh, don't know how that happened. <laughs> now, if all that goes well, in a moment, we should see that, uh, yep, here's com confirmation in Kibana that it's talking to our agent. So it's got data coming in. So our agent is now enrolled. Awesome. So what we're going to do now is jump over to the uptime UI. And there's monitor management. You can see that they're, we're encouraging you to discover this. Uh, we're going to enable monitor management. That just takes a moment. And then you can see here, there's there's this new private locations link um, that we've supplied. And this will pop this flyout open. And you can basically hit add location. If you've never set it up before, this is what you'll see. And there's links to documentation. Uh, but for now, we're just going to click on that. We'll define a location. I live in Pennsylvania. so. It's about, right? And then um, you need an agent policy defined in Fleet. And uh, we've already got that set up from the previous steps that we did when we were over in Fleet Management. 
Uh, it's a really seamless process setting fleet up when you're using Elastic Cloud like this. Uh, it all just kind of is working together very nicely. So you just select your policy. And that's all you have to do. At this point, you can hit save. And now you can see I have a private location defined. Uh, there are zero monitors configured for it right now. And then there again is the agent policy that it's going to use. Um, and one thing, if I can jump in, Justin, sure. uh, important to note is we we only support it's currently a single agent within one of those locations. Um, it's one of the things in the docs, but just be mindful of it. We're looking into some ways to support multiple agents and possibly load balancing or hot failover as well, but um, keep it to one agent per location for the time being. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, sort of uh, explaining that. I, I actually didn't know that you could only use one agent, so that's good learning for me. And we're gonna basically, one other thing we're gonna do in Kibana is uh, we're gonna define an API key um, for our user. And I'm just logged in as super user, but you might want to use more restrictive permissions when defining this key because you could use this API key to do anything you want to your cluster. So just name it something like that, create the API key. I'm going to copy this and also paste it in my gist because we might need it in a minute here. Okay. And then at this point, I think that we're ready to hop over to the terminal and sort of uh, show how easy it is to get up and running with synthetics. So uh, I am just going to make this directory. Uh, lots of directories that have synthetics in the name. Okay. And then from here, you can just do simply mpx stick synthetics, if you can spell it right. Init. And for those who don't know, this is just one of the ways that you can use synthetics. Um, you can also yeah. use a complete GUI flow, which we'll see a little later. But this is a great way to set up a project, which is good for complex, serious development where you're going to want to use an IDE to kind of um, write complex journeys. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's, there's a whole plethora of ways you can use it. Um, this is just one of the more accessible ways to sort of get up and running through like a nice CLI interface that um, will just ask you questions and configure everything and get it all working for you very quickly. Um, so it's going to first ask if you're using Elastic Cloud. We are, so we will say yes to that. And then I purposefully didn't copy the cloud ID because um, if you're not familiar with using the Elastic Cloud console, uh, you might not know exactly where to look to get this. So uh, let me just, did I close my cloud tab? Interesting. Well, fear not, we can just go right here and go into manage deployments. And our cloud ID is right here. So we can just click that little copy button. Not sure what that's showing up, but it's interesting. Uh, and then we'll just jump back to the terminal and paste that right there. And then it will ask for the API key that we just created. So again, I'll hop back over to my gist. Copy this. And then you can see here, not only is it supplying us with all of the public locations that you can choose from to deploy your journeys to, but you can also choose um, private locations that are configured. So we only have one right now. It's the one that we just made that I showed before. Um, so we can choose you know, two public locations and then the private one and enter. And then you can schedule an interval for your checks. I'm going to shorten it to something like three uh, minutes, just so we don't have to wait long for data to be populating. And then you'll choose a project ID to logically group uh, the monitors by. Um, it'll suggest one based on your um, policy, uh, I believe. So I'm just going to use that name. And then um, Kibana space is a little bit beyond the scope of this demo, but um, you're fine to just use the default. Uh, if you don't know what Kibana spaces are, the default will work fine. And if you do know what they are, then you probably don't need further explanation. Um, and so now you can see it's going to turn and do its thing. It's going to set some stuff up, generate some configuration files, and we will have some journeys that are configured and ready to go um, for the next step, which will be pushing them up to Kibana. 
So it looks like everything worked out pretty well. Um, I will run, uh, what is it, npm run push. And this will fail because it's going to need our API key. But I'm just doing it so if you run into this and see it happen, you'll know. So um, I believe it's. Uh, and then you need your API key again. So I'm just going to copy that in here. And now when I run this using the configuration that has been supplied to us uh, by through the CLI setup, uh, it should push the sample monitors that we've created. Um, and I don't know, I, I can open some of the files briefly if if we think that's of interest, Andrew, um, that, that got generated. When we yeah, I think that would be good. I think some okay. folks are familiar, but many may be not. So you can see it's uh, it's created the monitors, it's deleted anything that was stale, and then it, you know, push command succeeded. So I'm just going to show the contents of this directory real quickly. Um, the most pertinent file to our purposes is um, the synthetics config.ts that you see there. So I'm just going to open that. And um, you can see here some of the relevant information has sort of been filled in for us by the CLI. Uh, most notably, uh, the schedule we defined, the locations, uh, both public and private. Uh, this sort of just gives you some high level control over, over what's going on with your monitors. Uh, and I think I've stalled enough that if we jump back over to Kibana uh, and we go over to, copy that, right? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, if we jump over to the uptime UI, we should see our monitors. Yeah. And you can see here, uh, it's got, they've got three locations running for each of them. And uh, we've got some data getting logged. So you could click in here and sort of see um, you know, here's some screenshots. If you're familiar at all with the uptime UI and how it displays synthetics data, um, all is working as we would like. So with some minor configuration, uh, I mean, we've literally started from having no cluster at all to getting to where we are in just a couple of minutes, we've, we're monitoring websites. Um, if you're just getting into using synthetics, you can jump into the journeys and, and modify them to your heart's content. And you can rerun that push command multiple times and it will upsert your monitors and uh, your updates will, will start to show up as the service runs more uh, checks for you. Um, so that's pretty much showing like how to get things working with public and private monitors. You can jump into monitor management and edit these as well. Or no, you can't because they were created with push, right? Yeah, no, um, only only. But we could show the inline ones if, or, or unless you're going to show those later. Uh, no, we can we can go ahead and do that. So if we want to, um, sorry, I just have to move my picture in picture here. Uh, we can add a monitor, so we can call this one test inline. Um, you can choose the locations that you want. So you know, I choose U.S. East and West again, and. Um, Again, running from my private Pennsylvania one, that again is uh, this EC2 instance over here. It's just been quietly churning away in the background. Um, very easy to get started uh, just by creating a VM from your cloud provider of choice and a couple of minor steps and you can have your own managed uh, agent running uh, with your, your fleet server. Uh, it's also worth noting, you can make the lightweight checks that uh, longtime users of uptime might be familiar with uh, as well. I don't have an inline script prepared. Um, well, what we could do that might be interesting is just copy one of the ones that came, came with the um, synthetic, the, in, the one you ended it, and we can kind of show sure. that they're the inline scripts, um, for those who don't know, are really just a, a, a subset that's very slightly different from the full journey. So, so Justin's going to pull up um, the our simplest example journey over here. You'll see that there's um, a journey statement wrapping a few defined steps. So the journey is called my example journey. There's a and there's two steps. One is launch the application. One is assert the title. So all an inline script is what Justin's doing right now is just those two step statements minus the wrapping journey, and also without those monitor definition things because that monitor.use clause correlates to the form controls you have in a GUI. So the short answer is if you want to convert or to play with a project monitor as 
an inline script, just copy the step statements and 99% of the time that'll work. And uh, these page objects and stuff, just for anyone that doesn't know, you can supply them for inline uh, journeys and you don't actually have to have the definition there. That's something that synthetics will understand. So I just copied those. I think I did a good job of that. Okay, yeah. Um, and then also uh, there's this parameters field that we've sort of hinted at a couple of times. Uh, Andrew, do you think now is like a good opportunity to sort of Yeah, why stand on formality? We can, we can kind of just dive into that. So okay. um, you actually see that in use in the script. So I said 99% of the time copying it'll work. But there is one thing that you do need to set here for the script to work. So if we look at the second line of that inline script block in that text area up there, you'll see that the initial navigation, this is, Page.go2 sets the first URL uh, you want um, um, your monitor to go to. Justin, I don't know if you can hear my cat meowing, but he's he desperately wants to go outside. But he's going to he's gonna have to wait. He can wait a few minutes. Um, now, in this script, we've elected to, instead of hard coding that URL, which many people will do, make it a parameter. So we can demonstrate setting that parameter here. Um, so we can go in there. And what this is is a JSON object, and it's actually a code editor down there. And you can set, since it's JSON, you need the quotes, um, any URL that you want this to be. And we can just set it to whatever. Yeah. And it, the test is going to fail for Elastic.co because the, the second step, asserting the title, <laughs> um, will, not, will not be correct because it is not a to-do list app. Um, but the greater thing about parameters is this is a place where you can also store things like a common ask is passwords for, let's say, testing an admin area. Um, there is a caveat it's something to be aware of, which is that, as you can see, the secret is not hidden. Um, so why is that? Um, well, we can't just encrypt it one way. We have to be able to decrypt it later to actually run the test because we have to read that plain value and use it. So that's something to be aware of. We're contemplating maybe in the future building um, a UI that's more centered around secrets where it's still going to be decryptable, probably if you can do the right things. But... Um, it won't be a, a situation where, um, you know, it's plainly visible on the page, um, even though behind the scenes, that is kind of how it has to work for, for synthetics. Um, but yeah, um, it, it, the nice thing about parameters, of course, is having them separate from the script is that, and why you might want to do this, I don't think I got into that, is that you might want to update things like a URL or a, a password um, on some regular basis for some reason, but you might not want to touch the script source and it can give you a greater sense of security to not be digging through the script. Um, and if I can make one final point, um, uh, when you ran, you ran that push command earlier, uh, Justin, you can actually set for project monitors, that is the ones you defined in the CLI, not the GUI, you can actually set param parameters there like that, yes. Um, and I believe you actually, I'm not sure if the NPM run wrapper works with that. I always use the NPX um, Elastic uh, Synthetics push command. Maybe we should show that really quick. Um, yeah. Um, we kind of have two ways of doing the same thing. Internally, the run command does the same thing. Yes. And if you do this, the nice thing about this is with the UI at the moment, you can only set parameters one by one, monitor by monitor. Whereas with project monitors, this will apply those parameters to every single thing you are pushing up into the stack. So if you have 20 monitors, you only have to run this command once. It'll update all their secrets, all their parameters. And I think that's all I have to share on, on this topic. Uh, if you want to keep going, Justin. Okay. Uh, it might be worth noting that the API key might be supplied differently. It looks like it's looking for the auth uh, argument there um, for, for running push with uh, the MPX method. So um, it looks that's... like it failed using the... Sorry, yeah, that, that, is, that is right. And if you want, might, should we just cat the um, package JSON file just to show with the, the run command is just a, sure. a, a wrapper yeah. around that. Um, so um, you can see that we've just defined, or I guess we import it some other way. Um, but you can but, see it is supplying the auth uh, using that flag yeah. instead of using an environment variable. So if yes. you do go to use it, MPX one and you get that error, that's it's not a big deal. Just um, follow the prescribed error message and you'll get around it yeah. pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and you can customize those commands in that package file if you want as well. 
Yeah, uh, that's the great thing about using the init. If, if you're not familiar with it already, uh, like using synthetics, um, it gives you sort of a baseline that will just work out of the box and you can sort of start to play around with things from there. Um, looking at the docs is also a great idea. Um, and if anything's missing, please open an issue and give us that feedback so we can help make it better. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, if I hit run test, uh, it's gonna fail. Is the URL defined um, in the project monitor? Maybe we can change it from elastic.co. Yeah, we um, could we could point it to the right one. Um, where it's defined actually is in if you if you exit here and hit ls and go to synthetics.config.ts. Okay. So this example has one little bit of fanciness here. Now, uh, a lot of people would just hard code it. What this is over here is kind of a baseline config for all your monitors. So when you answer those questions, some of those answers came in here, but we also show setting a custom parameter. So this is like a parameter that is uh, um, what we call a parameter default. So this isn't something that you've set with the params command. This is just a default value where if you have not set it, this will be used. So if you do set it, you're overriding this. So actually you could just push it without any parameters and it would work, or you could explicitly set it. Gotcha. Uh, so I've copied that. And if we just jump back in here and paste that. Now, if I hit run, this should work. And you can see it's gonna run it in all three locations. So it's running it in our, uh, public endpoints, they seem to be a little bit ahead. And then it's also going to run it in the private location. Or no. Uh, I, I should mention the that. private locations actually don't support um, yeah. running no, them. I, and this is <laughs> I saw this three is lines have open right now. I saw three rows and I was like, that must be what's happening. But no, it, it's uh, going to show a test result here. Yeah. And I think the bug is that we actually don't show the run button if you have only private locations. But if you have a mix, um, we have this behavior, which we're going to fix in a patch release really soon. Yeah, uh, private location is a very new feature. Uh, it's just coming out in 8.4. So uh, there will certainly be a couple of things to tighten up, but it's very exciting to give that flexibility to users. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit save monitor. Um, that'll save it. And then we should see it pop up in management right away. I don't know if we'll see it if we jump over to uptime just yet, because we're not going to have any data to display. Um, but it is there and data should start to trickle in, uh, anytime. So I think that that pretty much covers the demo. Is there anything else that we wanted to cover, Andrew, that you think we missed? Uh, if we can jump back to the agenda, I could use a quick reminder of what our next topic sure. is. <laughs> um, let's see. So here's the, here's the agenda slide. Well, we yeah, so, I think we covered we covered that that demo. Um, so I think we we're going to the next um, large topic. And I think, and we've covered quite a bit. Oh, the the public beta. This is a pretty yeah. simple one. Um, for people who have not tried those public testing locations, um, this used to be something that took a little bit more work. Now it's simple. Actually, Justin, if you don't mind just going back to your cluster, we can kind of just show this. Sure. Um, what I would recommend doing is upgrading to the latest 8.4 point, I think it's one at the time of this recording, whatever mm -hmm. the latest version of the Elastic Stack is, going to the Uptime app, and you can get to there by going to Observability in that left-hand bar, looking on Uptime. I mean, I assume if you're watching this, you might know, you already know how to get to the Uptime app. And then click on that new Monitor Management button at the top of the page. Um, previously, you'd have to get um, led into a limited beta. Now it's a public beta. Everyone has access to this. Everyone can create monitors. So. Um, we're excited to open this up to more people without uh, that extra approval step. But you do need to be on the latest version, 8.4.0, to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I keep moving the picture in picture in Zoom to the worst possible spot. It just covers everything I need to click on. It's always in the wrong spot with Zoom. It's, it's, I yeah. have that struggle as well. And um, did you want to cover data retention, or should I go into this one? Uh, why don't you cover it? Okay, I could use your help on this because you already have a cluster open. So okay. in 8.4, we have improved the data retention by story by popular request. So you have monitors set up, you have data coming in. Um, you probably don't want to keep it for all eternity, especially not screenshot data. 
and um, network data. Um, network data. So actually, Justin, could we pull go to Stack Management and pull up the uh, data streams? Um, be great. Yeah. So where we're going here is if you go on the left hand bar, um, index management up there. We're going to take a look at what data we're recording, and if you click on data streams, mm -hmm. and then search for synthetics, just to kind of cut it out down. So we're only doing browser tests now. If you were in this demo now, if you were using lightweight checks, you would see additional data streams for each of these. And what data streams are is a way of wrapping up all the data for a given uh, kind of segmented use case. So um, browser ones are a little different from lightweight HTTP ones and um, ICMP and TCP ones in that we record three separate data streams instead of just one. And the reason we do it is, is because um, these network data, uh, the network data, which is what drives the waterfall view, which is that view of all the individual requests each page load make, take up a lot of space. And so do the screenshots. Surprisingly, the network data takes up a lot more space than the screenshots, which was totally mind blowing to me, at least. I did not anticipate it, but it makes sense when you think about it. Modern sites um, often make hundreds of external requests. And when we record all that metadata, it really adds up, even with compression and you know, some smart optimizations we've done. Also, we've been able to optimize screenshots in some really interesting ways where we actually cut them up into a grid of squares and then um, store them, store the hash of them in unique documents and basically have the ability to deduplicate sections of images to um, save you disk space. So the point is, coming back from that tangent, you've got three types of data. You probably want to store that just plain synthetics browser default data stream for a long time. It doesn't take up very much space. You might want to store it for a whole year. So that's the current default. After a year, we start deleting data. The second two, you probably don't want to store that long. Um, and that's kind of the norm for synthetics products. You can change it, but um, what we have changed the default to be, which by popular request, is network data for two weeks and screenshot data for two weeks by default. Of course, you can change it, but that's kind of um uh the situation right now um uh that's the default so um uh the other thing that's changed is in prior versions um we put everything in 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 only in a smaller number of streams so this is kind of just nicer now as well um and if you're coming from heartbeat uh seven or older versions of the cluster um you're used to everything being in a single heartbeat stream so this is if you're new to what we've been doing that's a huge improvement um now, for most people, these defaults are good. If you want to override this, we do have this in our synthetics docs, if you look in our data retention docs, um, but it's a little complicated. Um, but I can, it might be worth me walking through this. It, you know, sure. you're already going here, Justin, maybe do you, would you mind if I if just kind of be in my my hands on this one? Yeah. So uh, if you click on, uh, let's say the network data, let's say we want to retain network data for two months instead of two weeks. I'll show you how this works. So you can click on it and it'll cause this fly out to open. And um, you can see a bunch of facts. You can see the size. It is really tiny, but just because we just started doing mm -hmm. stuff. So it's, you know, for a few monitors, those, those megabytes add up. So the thing that we want to be tuned into is that index lifecycle policy um, on the right-hand side of this panel. And that's going to define the lifecycle. So we can click on this and see what the current one is. Now, this is something that's kind of a somewhat unique feature for Elastic. A lot of competing products don't let you change the lifecycle policies at all. We let you do it. It's kind of complicated now. We'd eventually like to make it simpler. Um, but right now it's in the category of, I would say, things that are kind of complicated to do, but definitely definitely doable. We're going to get through this in, in just a few minutes um, if you follow along. So we're looking at the default policy. Um, and if you see, if you click on that advanced settings button underneath it, right there, yeah, and under the yeah, hot face. Sorry, I am no I'm worries, terrible no, at finding very things easy. on screens. I have to you're, use Command F. <laughs> you're going to see an important setting, which is the maximum age of one days. And what this means isn't that your data goes away after one day. It means that every day, internal to that data stream, so a data stream is just a collection of indexes rolled over on a time basis or on a size basis. On a time basis, every day, we're going to roll that over and make a separate index internally. So after 14 days, you have 14 indexes. And then if we scroll to the bottom of this page and we look at the delete phase, 
um, we see that we move data into the deletion phase after 14 days. So the reason we have that other setting at one day and this one at 14 is we want to make sure that if we had set it to, let's say, five days of to roll over those indexes, well, then the delete phase wouldn't be able to delete it exactly on that 14th day because the it's it's at a different level of granularity. And that is a little confusing. Um, it kind of makes sense when you think about it and like gives you more flexibility, but it's it's a, it's a gotcha, I think, to understanding it. Now, the second gotcha, um, and we do cover this in our docs, is that while you can modify this policy, we're actually the first um, solution in the Elastic Stack to kind of have this tight linkage of ILM policies with a solution. Um, so um, when we do updates to the stack, um, this ILM policy will be overridden. So you can change this, but you shouldn't. If you change this to 30 days, it would just work, but it would stop working when you do the next update. So don't change the setting. Um, there's a different way and it's a little circuitous, but it'll just take a couple of minutes when you see it, it, it won't be so scary. So um, let's cancel, let's get out of this um, if we can. And Andrew, good. just to just to interrupt for one second, if anyone doesn't know what ILM stands for, it just stands for Index Lifecycle Management, right? Yes, that's exactly okay. right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a new ILM policy, and then we're going to apply it. So you can hit that Create button at the top right. And we'll make this one do the same thing, but cycle after every 30 days. So we'll go, yeah, we'll give it a name. I don't know. It's a terrible name. <laughs> it's a terrible name, but it will be fine for this demo. And we'll go to the hot phase and we'll go to advanced settings. Um, okay. And we'll change that that default number. Um, what am I missing here? I clicked on the wrong advanced settings. Oh, uh, see where it says use rec. You know, you're right. You're, you're okay. right. Uncheck that use recommended defaults. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. And um, maximum age, make it one day. And then we'll and that's, go. That's so we have the granularity that you mentioned. Yeah. So we have more flexibility. And you don't have to do that, but just keep in mind you have that kind of complex interaction between retention here and then deletion later. So um, now, if you go to the very bottom of the page, we're gonna we're gonna not. You could set up warm phases and cold phases, but that's beyond our where we are now. Um, and oh, sorry, go go up a bit. Um, is deletion higher up? Uh, Maybe just close that advanced settings for now. That's fine. Oh, I see. You have to, sorry, you have to go hit the delete, uh, close the advanced settings. Okay. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see there that infinity sign is? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, click on the trash can and we'll, we'll uh, get it. There we go. Now we so we're not keeping this forever. Now you could keep it forever. That could be another change you want, um, but that's not what we're doing today. And then we'll make this number be the number of days we want, which is, I believe we said we we're going to make it like, what? Let's make it 30 days. Uh, yeah, I thought really you said 30. <laughs> Okay, so now we will save it um, and we'll remember that name that we came up with. And what was it? It was Synthetics Longer. Synthetics Longer, yeah, really bad. Okay, so now that we have a policy, but it's not attached to anything, we actually have to attach it to um, our Synthetics data. So it overrides that stuff. And this, we're gonna override that stuff in a way that persists even after upgrades and stuff. So if we go back to index management, and we go back to data streams and we search for synthetics and we click on the network default again. Nothing, nothing here has changed yet. We can see that there's an index template and there's a life cycle policy. Um, now that we're going to go back to this life cycle policy later, what if you click on that index template? What you can see here, and if you go to settings on that second tab, is, and we're going we're to copy this. Um, this is uh, kind of where we're setting. Uh, oh, sorry, this isn't what I meant to copy. Uh, go back to summary. Uh, oh, I thought something was in here. It doesn't really matter. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to change this so that it points to the right policy. Can you click on preview? I just want to see if the thing I was looking for was in there. Ah, here's where it is. So what we're going to copy is that block where it says index lifecycle name. You don't have to copy it, but I'm doing it because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to override. We're getting into the internals of Elasticsearch index settings. What we're going to do is we're going to override the index lifecycle name setting. 
Um, and instead of it pointing to this one that's kind of our default policy, we're going to point it at the one we just made. So we can get out of here, uh, close that little fly out, and we can go to component templates. So templates define the settings for data streams. And we're going to skip past a bunch of complexity there because it's that would be a longer thing. But we're going to search now for synthetics over here. And the way we set things up is that there are, for every stream, there is an at package and at custom version. And luckily, the one we want is at the top. We have synthetics browser network at custom and browser network at package. You only ever want to edit the at custom ones. So if you click on the edit button for that, um, uh, you can jump ahead to the in step two, which is index settings. You can um, paste in what we what we copied. Yep. Does it need to be an index here on the outside? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, and just change that lifecycle name to the one we created, which I think was synthetics, synthetics longer, longer policy. Yeah. But you do need that wrapping bracket. Right. Right. You are. OK, and then we can actually kind of skip ahead here and go straight to step five or hit next a bunch of times. Um, and we're not setting any of the other settings, and then hit Save. Great. And if we want to confirm that this worked, what we can do is go back to data streams. And yeah, you already know where we're going. We're going back here. And we see that that is now in effect. Um, now, the neat thing about this is that you can define, you don't have to do this for every data stream. You could define one policy and apply it since it's flexible. If you apply it to the templates for five, they can all point at one policy. So you can kind of do one thing to update everything, or you can organize it however you find useful. Um, so I hope this is helpful for, for people who would like to change these policies. Um, most people are pretty good with the defaults of two weeks for that really rich screenshot data and that really rich network request level data and then the year retention for the rest. But if you want to change it, this is how. Awesome. Well, thanks for helping me go through all of that. That was, you know, maybe a lot for some people, but uh, it's I'm nice not going to say it's easy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice to know that you do have that flexibility if retention is something that you're looking to do yeah. longer or maybe shorter than two weeks if you just don't care about your screenshots for that long of a time. Yeah, and we are having conversations about how we might be able to improve this flow, but um, it might be a while. It's not, you know, it's not something people change that often. So um, it probably would be something we'd be thinking about a little later down the line. Okay, um, so that covers data retention in in some good granular detail. Um, better story for secrets and params. We've touched on this a bit already. Is there anything yeah, you want to no. add there? I think we covered that pretty well. So I think you did a great job demoing it. I don't think we have anything more to cover. I think that was the last topic we had. Is that right? Or is there one more? Nope, that's if it. That's all, folks. <laughs> um, this is our first video. If you have any thoughts on it, please you know, let us know. Reach out. Um, if, you're, if, if we do, um, if you have a chance to send us a comment, we would really appreciate it. Um, if you have ideas for things you'd like us to demo, demonstrate, um, that'd be good. We hope to do one of these for future releases. I'd also like to make some videos around um, creation of, of synthetic monitoring scripts and answering questions people have about that and kind of showing how to how how to build them, um, uh, you know, and how how we work through constructing those things because it's not always obvious and you know there's stumbling blocks. Um, that's that's about it. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Justin? Uh, no, uh, aside from, you know, the touching on what you just said, uh, we have a script recorder. If you're not, if you're not aware of that, um, we'd love to do a video sort of demoing that, uh, what we have so far and maybe talk a bit about some features that we'd like to add, uh, down the line, but yeah, uh, really great job, uh, Andrew on guiding us through this and, um, well, thank I you for doing the demo. Was that was the hard part, Justin, um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you for everyone out there who is watching this, and we hope you enjoy the product. Yeah, thanks, everyone.